Good morning, Texas. I hope everybody is doing good, um, as good as could be expected with the ed 87th legislative session and what we've seen this year for the bills that are a few days away from becoming law or bills that may have already been signed. So we're going to be talking today about all of the bills, whether they are law yet or whether they're already law and maybe becoming effective now or becoming effective September 1st. I will be leading the discussion here today. My name is Clint Brown, of course, with Roberts Markell, Weinberg, Butler, Haley, equity shareholder and leading our Property Owners Association Division for Texas. I am lucky enough to have one of a TCAA's board members that stands for Texas uh, Con Community Association Advocates, uh, Mr. Paul Gaines. He's one of our attorneys down in San Antonio. So he is on the board for TCAA and has been heavily involved in this year's legislative session. So a couple reminders for y'all. We're going to be moving things a little bit differently today, but first and foremost, let's do our Legal disclaimer. Attorneys love their disclaimers, right? Uh, maybes and all that other good stuff. So the information presented today is based on the law as it exists as of today. And again, some of the bills we're going to be talking about today aren't necessarily a law yet. So the information that Paul and I are going to be discussing is for educational purposes only and does not constitute legal advice. If you need that advice, please be sure to consult the association's counsel. Uh, today, we are going to be doing it a little bit differently. We're going to try to limit our discussion today for 45 minutes so that we've got about 15 minutes at the end to really address a lot of the questions that are being posed. We've already got a number of questions that were submitted prior to today's webinar that we're going to be answering. Uh, and then after that, we are going to be going through our Q&A process. So down at the bottom, you'll see a little Q&A bubble. Uh, if a question pops up in your mind that you want to ask while Paul and I are discussing bills, please type it in. Know that we are not going to be addressing questions throughout the course of the presentation. We're going to be answering those questions at the end. So let's get started. These are the bills that passed, uh, Senate bills and House bills. Again, some of these bills have already become law, have already been signed by the governor. Uh, some of these other bills are still on the governor's desk. With that, I will turn it over to Mr. Gaines to talk a little bit about the legislative session and roll into SB 1588. Paul? Thank you, Clint, and good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending today. Uh, we're excited to be presenting on uh, the 87th legislative session. It's been a wild ride. And we're going to go right into it with the largest and most concerning bill um, that has been passed by the House and the Senate and is currently awaiting the signature of the governor. That's Senate Bill 1588. The title of this bill is relating to the powers and duties of property owners associations. Uh, however, this was marketed heavily by the Texas Realtors as quote unquote HOA reform. The original author is Hughes, co-author was Springer. Uh, there was a companion bill out there, House Bill 3367. So the enrolled version of the bill is the version we'll be discussing today. That's the version that's been signed by the House, by the Senate, and is sitting on the governor's desk for signature. All that took place on May 31st, 2021. Uh, there are 27 sections to this particular bill. So we'll be going through each section one by one, the ones that are uh, going to be highlighted by us and are uh, more pertinent to the changes for POA law. Um, a little background on kind of how Senate Bill 1588 uh, became the monster that it is today. Whenever the Senate passed it, it went to the House for the vote. And surprisingly, right before the House was going to vote on it, seven different amendments were tacked on at the last minute. Uh, most of these amendments were already bills that we were focused on and uh, that pertain to POAs. So last minute, seven amendments added. Later on, three more amendments were also added. Uh, pertaining to POAs. So this bill has, has grown and grown and grown and has a huge impact on the POA industry. Um, as I previously stated, it was supported by the Texas Realtors. Uh, most of the provisions of Senate Bill 1588, if it does go into law, 
uh, will be effective September 1st, 2021. So with that, let's go ahead and roll into the different sections of Senate Bill 1588. I'll leave it to you, Mr. Brown. Perfect. And Paul, I've got a question for you for the governor. So, you know, you had mentioned that it, the bills are currently on the governor's desk. What's the drop dead date that the governor has to take action, number one? And then number two, if the, go if the governor doesn't take any action, right, doesn't approve or reject the bill, does that mean the bill doesn't become law? What, what happens in that event? So we have until the 20th. The 20th is going to be the deadline for that veto. And unfortunately, even if it's not signed, so if it's signed, it goes in, into, uh, into play. If it's not signed and he just lets it slide through, it's still going to become law. Gotcha. So there's three, three ways the governor can, can basically act or not act. Number one, he can approve the bill, which makes it effective or turned into law that day, not necessarily effective that day. The second way is he can deny it. What, what happens if he vetoes or, or denies the bill? Well, if he vetoes, and arguably it's not going to become or it's not going to be passed. So that's what we have been pushing for. Um, and at the end of uh, our discussion on Senate Bill 1580, we will discuss a call of action, and we will discuss with all of you, the board members, managers, and uh, industry professionals, how you can assist on really going against this bill. Because in our opinion, there are many, many detrimental effects in this bill uh, to the POA industry. Yeah. So if at the end of this presentation, if that's something you want to look at, there are still a few days left. Uh, I, I looked this morning, uh, SB 1588 has still not been signed by the governor. So if, if it is something you want to oppose, there are ways that you can get a letter to the governor um, through TCAA. So, all right, 1588, let's start off with section number one. This applies to both single family communities and condominiums, and it amends section 202.006 of the Texas Property Code by adding subsection C. And it's kind of weird because it basically says you can't collect a regular assessment and then uses the definition in chapter 209. Well, chapter 209 doesn't apply to condos, um, but then it says if the dedicatory instrument authorizing collection of assessments is not filed in the property records. So again, kind of a, a bill that wasn't worded well, uh, but it is what it is, and it got tacked on to SB 1588. So keep that in mind. We've got to have the dedicatory instruments recorded in the real property records for enforcement. Most communities already have that because there's another section in 202, this section, that basically says it's not enforceable unless you get it recorded. So kind of... Odd section, poorly worded, but that's what we've got to deal with. All right, section two, religious displays. And we will be discussing another Senate bill uh, a little later on, uh, Senate Bill 581, that also pertains to religious displays. So this section, Senate Bill 1588, will amend section 202.018A of the Texas Property Code. Uh, this will provide that property owners associations may not adopt or enforce a provision a dedicatory instrument that would prohibit an owner from displaying or affixing on the owner's property or dwelling one or more religious items. So what's concerning about this particular bill is that it's extending uh, the uh, permissible area to the property and the dwelling uh, where previous law would only provide for the entryway of the home. So it really opens the floodgates uh, to these specific items. Um, arguably, whenever you talk about the property, you're talking about the entire property that the owner owns, um, again, expanding it well beyond the entryway. All right, so these are the kind of carve outs for when the association can step in and regulate those religious displays. And they can regulate when the item threatens public health or safety, when the item violates a law other than a law regarding prohibition of display of religious free speech, uh, you can regulate when it contains graphics or language that is patently offensive to passerby other, for, uh, for reasons other than religious content. Patently offensive is a legal term of art used in a lot of case law. Unfortunately, it's pretty subjective. Uh, so what does that mean? Well, we're going to have to find out. Uh, and then finally, when the religious display is installed on common area or association property, or violates building lines, easements, or setbacks, or attached to a traffic 
control device, lamp, fire hydrant, or utility pole. Now, one thing that, I, and this does apply to single family communities and condominiums, and one thing I don't think the drafters thought about is this number four as it applies to condominiums. So the way this is worded, it, it says it's installed on common area association property or, associ or property the association is charged with maintaining. So what's unique about that is condominiums, most of the time the association is charged with the obligation to maintain what? The exterior of the units. So because the association maintains the exterior of the units, technically we can prevent a person from affixing a religious item to their front door. The old law, the, the law that's been current up until today specifically allowed condominium owners to affix something to their front door. So uh, they, they inadvertently became more restrictive for condominium associations. And you've really got to think about that when you're adopting a new religious display policy. So action item for here, you're going to have to adopt new religious display policies to comply with the new law. And if you're a condominium, you've really got to think about how you want to allow um, religious displays being affixed to kind of the front door area. Now, Paul, on, on this religious display bill, if uh, let's say you're a Christian and you want to install a 30 foot cross in your front yard, and let's assume there are no setback violations, does this bill allow you to do that? Arguably, yes. And that is what is so concerning about this bill. Of course, we're taking it to extremes here. We're hoping that that's not something that does occur. But as Clint and I both know, uh, never say never in this industry. Um, you always see uh, some pretty wild things whenever dealing with uh, POAs and owners. And um, whenever he presents this hypothetical and looking at the language of the statute, arguably, yes, you could, uh, you could build that structure. Section three, swimming pool fences. This would add section 202.022 to the Texas Property Code and would prohibit an association from adopting or enforcing a provision in a governing document that would prohibit or restrict an owner from installing a swimming pool enclosure that conforms to applicable state or local safety requirements. So associations can still enforce a provision relating to the appearance of the enclosure, which would include the regulation of the color as well. However, such regulation cannot prohibit a black swimming pool enclosure that consists of transparent mesh set in metal frames. This particular section is also a little concerning. Um, whenever we talk about black swimming pool enclosures that consist of transparent mesh set in metal frames, well, arguably you're talking about one of those large enclosures that goes over the entire pool. Uh, this is something you see a lot in Florida. Uh, you do not see it a lot in Texas. But looking at the language of the statute, it's broad enough to include those particular structures. This would apply to single family and condominiums. And because of, of the way that this is written and whether or not this would apply for the large enclosures over the entire swimming pool, uh, we definitely recommend that if this bill goes into effect, um, that you contact your legal counsel and discuss with them what can be done to uh, regulate the appearance of the enclosure and then also the colors as well, whether this be a policy or resolutions that, that's passed. Um, a lot of these particular provisions in Senate Bill 1588 uh, are going to uh, make the board or need the board to take action whenever it comes to uh, adopting policies to address all the new language under this bill. Yeah, so, you know, Paul, is it kind of in, important um, that they use the term enclosure rather than fence. So does enclosure suggest that Florida type uh, setup? It certainly does. Um, whenever you look at the way this was, was written, uh, we've seen fences in some of the other sections of Senate Bill 1588. So whenever you see the term enclosure, yes, I would say that it's broad enough to include uh, those large enclosures that you see in Florida. So again, get, get with counsel. Um, you're going to have to think about a swimming pool enclosure policy. And that very question is really going to have to be looked at because of the way this statute is, is worded, you 
may be able to start installing those enclosure type uh, setups similar to seen in, in Florida. All right, section four, security measures. There is uh, another bill that Paul's gonna be going into later on down the road that more or less mirrors this, but basically this prevents a uh, POA. It does not apply to condos and master mixed uh, use POAs in Texas, so keep that in mind, but it, it prohibits an association from adopting or enforcing a covenant that prevents an owner from building or installing security measures. And it's including, but not limited to, kind of a such as security cameras, motion detectors, and perimeter fencing. Perimeter fencing. So what is perimeter fencing? Well, when you look at the term perimeter, it usually means the perimeter of the lot, you, the, the land you own. So arguably, this perimeter fencing allows for the installation of fencing in the entire front yard area. So most communities in the state of Texas pro prohibit perimeter fencing once you get to that front portion of your, of your home, right? So you can't have the perimeter fencing any further than that. The way this statute is worded, it would prevent the association from prohibiting that type of fencing. Now, you can regulate the type of fencing used. Does that mean height or does that just mean material? So a really good question on, on height, um, whether or not we can regulate height because that is a type of fencing or an aspect of fencing, number one. Number two, we can no longer enforce the, the fencing. So we can adopt a security measure policy. We can regulate the type of fencing, which may include height. But in terms of placement, our hands are tied. Keep in mind that just because the association's hands may be tied as it relates to fencing, it does not mean if you're within city limits, there, there could be a code of ordinances applicable to you that would prevent fencing maybe on corner lots or other types of lots or prevent fencing within a certain setback area, uh, period, end of sentence. So if you are within city limits or maybe there's some sort of county regulation then there may be a way to prevent fencing up to the front property line. But again, it, it really is more of a association by association consideration. And you've got to think through how you're going to effectively enforce that uh, for applications for fencing. The other big issue are is security cameras, motion sensors, and, and arguably floodlights. Does this mean that Bob, the owner, uh, sorry if there are any Bobs on the phone today, does this mean that Bob can install a, you know, 20 foot pole with floodlights on it and a motion sensor that basically glares on in the middle of the night when motion is detected and basically causes disruption or nuisance to Bob's neighbors? Some really big ramifications for this one. And it's because it's just so in, in our opinion, poorly worded. It really wasn't thought out uh, and it, it's gonna cause some, some big concerns. So again, be sure to work with your council to come up with a policy to do your best to, uh, to enforce your, your regulations on this particular bill. The next section, resale certificates. This would amend section 207.003C of the Texas Property Code would only apply to single family, uh, does not apply to condominiums, but this section will cap resale certificate fees at 375 and any updated resale certificate fee at $75. So the deadline to deliver a resale certificate after the second request of an owner. So whenever an owner requests this information, you have the deadline of 10 days. If you do not deliver it, then the owner can submit a second request. That is what this provision is applicable to. That would change the deadline then from seven days to five days. And then an owner would be permitted to seek a judgment against the association for not more than $5,000 for failure to deliver the information in a timely manner. And as you can see, the current amount is $500. So this is raised uh, significantly within this bill uh, to an amount of $5,000 just for the failure to deliver a resale certificate. So Paul, on, on, on that one uh, for resale certificates, 
let's say a title company calls, you know, management company A and says, hey, I need a resale certificate by tomorrow. Normally, the management company would say, okay, we can put you to the front of the line, but it's going to cost you kind of an acceleration fee, right? A, a rush fee. Um, with this statute, does that prevent the imposition of a, of a rush fee? Looking at the language, uh, it's, it's very broad. There are no exceptions or caveats. So I would say that the expedited fee would not be authorized pursuant to this provision. So, you know, the, it, it seems like the real estate lobbyists may, may have somewhat kind of shot themselves in, their, in, in the foot on this because I, I think everybody on the phone can acknowledge the fact that y'all get a lot of rush resale certificate requests. And with this law, it kind of prevents you from charging that extra fee, which means you respond with, okay, we're going to respond in accordance with statutory guidance. And if they demand it tomorrow, you say, look, I'm sorry we got capped out on fees. Uh, maybe you should speak with your realtor about this particular law. I think there is a theme today that Clint's touching on as well. Is it's just the fact that a lot of this was not well thought out. Um, people didn't put it into hypotheticals. They just wanted to push it through, push it through, push it through. And at the end of the day, this is what we're stuck with. Um, so in a few years, whenever we're looking at another session, um, after this is actually put into play in the real world, we might be seeing some changes to this, hopefully soon. All right, uh, online subdivision information. This uh, adds section 207.006. It applies to single family communities, not condominiums. And basically the association has to make the current versions of their dedicatory instruments available on a website maintained by the association and, or management company and available to community members. And it applies to community associations composed of at least 60 lots or a community association that is contracted with a management company. This law was similarly worded. They have basically clarified it a, a little bit and provided, you know, kind of more specifics. Quickly, we'll discuss section nine, uh, which would amend the definition of management company under section 209.002 of the Texas Property Code, only applies to single family communities. Uh, the definition is just provided here. That would be a person or entity established or contracted to provide management or administrative services on behalf of a property owners association. All right, TREC filings. TREC stands for Texas Real Estate Commission, Section 10. It uh, only applies to single family and it amends Section 209.004 of the Texas Property Code. And it basically requires management certificates to kind of get beefed up a little bit. So management certificates already have to comply with certain statutory guidance under this section. And it adds some. Basically, now you've got to have phone number, you've got to have email address for the managing agent. You also have to have kind of web site information for getting access to the dedicatory instruments via web. And then finally, it uh, requires you to describe the amount and, uh, and, and basically describe the transfer fees. So you've got to provide for what the transfer fees are now in the management, cer uh, in the management certificate. Additionally, not later than the seventh day after the date the association files a certificate, the association must then file it with TREC. And that one takes effect, I believe, December 1st of this year. And TREC's got to establish some sort of way to allow for community associations to, uh, to, to file it properly. Now, if this is not followed, if this process is not followed, associations, uh, owners within associations that have not followed the process, they don't have to pay attorney's fees related to collection or deed restriction enforcement, or excuse me, just collection and interest. So it is imperative that you get your management certificates updated, number one, and then number two, you file it with TREC as soon as the filing process is set up by then. Because if you don't, attorney's fees for those delinquent assessments cannot be levied against owners. And, and that's a big problem. Same thing with interest. 
All right, section 11, ACC members. Uh, before we discuss this, I will do, I will discuss the, uh, the carve out that they provide in this particular provision in regards to the development period. Uh, so this would only apply to an association with more than 40 lots, and it would not apply during the development period or during a period when the declarant may appoint a majority of the members on the ACC or control the appointment of the ACC or has the right to veto or modify a decision of the ACC. So essentially, if it's the development period and they have control of the ACC, it's not going to apply. This provision states that a person is prohibited from serving on the ACC if the person is one, a current board member, two, a current board member's spouse, or three, a person residing in a current board member's household. This is gonna have a huge effect on uh, the POA industry. It's already difficult to find volunteers uh, to be on a lot of these positions. Um, whenever you are restricting who can actually be on the ACC, um, a lot of these smaller communities might not be able to find volunteers to be on the ACC. Um, in regards to this provision, it also does provide that an owner is now permitted to appeal a decision by the ACC to the board. Uh, the notice that any application denial has to be provided to the owner, and then the board must hold the hearing within 30 days after the date uh, the board receives the owner's request. This would only apply to single family, uh, does not apply to condominiums. All right. Um, again, ACC members, and this actually, everybody's familiar. Again, single family, um, but everybody's familiar with kind of the quote unquote 209 hearing that is currently in place. And it basically allows an owner to request a hearing before the board. The owner comes to the board during executive session and the owner presents his or her case, right? Says X, Y, and Z. Uh, we would always encourage the association board to listen, to ask a couple high level questions, but not to make any decisions in front of the other party. Why? Because you're a board of three, five, or seven, or whatever the number is, you're not a board of one. And so when, you know, there's a chance that somebody could make a conclusory statement without there being a formal vote. So we always encourage listening. This bill now requires more or less a mini trial for those 209 hearings. There's evidence that has to be exchanged, communications, pictures, documentation. The evidence gets to be presented at uh, this, this hearing. Recording of the hearing is permitted. It, it was in, in the old law, so no big change there. But it really does turn everything into this mini trial issue. And that mini trial is going to require the association to follow a more formalized process. And unfortunately, it means you're going to have to get your counsel involved, at, at least for the first couple 209 hearings, because this has to be done correctly. Because if you violate this section of 209, there are going to be some stricter ramifications, some, some bad ramifications that Paul's going to be talking about here in a, a minute. So you're going to have to probably get counsel involved at, at least for the first few 209s to understand how the process has to take place, number one. Number two, you know, you're going to have to get a new 209 in, you know, policy in place for these hearings, a new 209 hearing policy, because there are a lot more uh, processes and procedures you have to follow. Section 12, uh, board meetings. This would amend section 209.0051 of the Texas Property Code. Thus, it would only apply to single family associations. So this would raise the current board meeting notice to 144 hours before the start of the regular board meeting. The current statute does provide for 72 hours. And then for a special board meeting, you would have to have at least 72 hours before the start of that meeting. Now, Paul, on, on that one, um, th there's something on budget as well, right? Yes. So one of the changes that, that was made um, under the 15 items that must be discussed in an open board meeting and approved in an open board meeting, um, one of the items that was changed is that any changes to the budget. So now any change to the budget has to be approved, discussed in that open board meeting. Uh, before it was um, any changes that would raise it by 10%, I believe. 
Thanks, Paul. Okay, uh, section 13 and section 14. So section 13 uh, amends 209.0052 of the Texas Property Code. It applies only to single family communities and, uh, or, you know, com communities subject to chapter 209. And now if the association wants to contract for services that will cost more than $50,000, you have to follow this uh, very drawn out process that 209.052 addresses. Now, that section of the Texas Property Code was usually used uh, when a board member was also trying to enter into a contract with the association, basically an interested board member. A, a board member owns a company, wanted to contract with the association through that company, and this section required a bunch of processes to, to be followed for that contract to be effective. Now this, this applies to all contracts that will cost more than $50,000. That's going to lead to some, some problems with evergreen contracts, contracts that renew on a yearly basis. Um, what, what about a five-year contract that's only $20,000 a year, but then adds up to over $50,000? All things that may require much more strict processes be followed before you can enter into the contract. So, again, uh, you're probably going to have to look at adopting some sort of policy to make sure this uh, contract uh, authorization process is followed to the T. And you're going to have to get with your counsel to, to discuss that as an option. Section 14, uh, 209, Chapter 209, Enforcement Action Notice. And it, it basically uh, implements credit reporting services. So there are some management companies in the state of Texas that use credit bureau reporting uh, prior to turning the matter over to the association's attorney for a collection. And for those management companies that utilize credit reporting, they've now got to follow a much more complicated process before they can properly credit report. Section 16, 209 Assessment Delinquency Notice. This is a big one. Um, I did see a question earlier if uh, 209 notices would have to be changed under Senate Bill 1588, and this is the section that's going to change them. This would require a property owners association to give owners 45 days to cure the delinquency before further collection action is taken. Currently, it's 30 days. So if you have a 209 template, if you're a management company board, um, that 30 days is going to need to be taken off. It's going to be, uh, need to be revised to 45 days. And this only applies to single family associations. Uh, section 17, uh, talk a little more about credit reporting services. This would prohibit an association or collection agent from reporting fines, fees, or assessments to a credit reporting service if the charges are quote unquote disputed. What does disputed mean? Does that mean it's disputed in writing? Does that mean it was a phone call from an owner saying, I dispute this? Well, unfortunately, under the provision, that is not clear. The fees, fines, or assessments may be reported only if, one, 30 days prior to reporting the POA, sends a notice of all delinquent charges to the owner, and two, the owner has had an offer of a payment plan. Um, strange that the delinquency was, or the notice requirements for the 209 delinquency was changed from 45, uh, or two 45 days from 30 days, but the credit reporting services, we only have 30 days in there. Um, for the offer of the payment plan, that's gonna be something standard in the 209 notice. Uh, associations may not charge a fee to an owner for the reporting of the delinquent payment history. So any credit reporting services fees, any credit bureau fees, uh, those are now off the table if this thing is passed and goes into effect. Uh, this particular section would only apply to single family homeowner associations. So again, if, if you're with, uh, you know, you're with a management company, whether you're a board member or manager, and y'all use those services, you now have a much more complicated process that has to be followed. And if you want to still report, you need to get with your counsel because a policy will have to be adopted to make sure you, you do it right, you know, because again, there are ramifications we're going to be talking about if you do it wrong. All right, Section 18, Chapter 209 hearings, uh, it, it amends 209.007. Again, applies to single family only. And it basically 
again, that evidentiary requirement I was talking about earlier, you've got to deliver this evidence packet to the owner containing your evidence that the association is going to introduce at the hearing. Uh, again, mini trial idea. And if you don't do it, then there's a postponement and you still have to do it. So when the hearing takes place, you don't get to listen anymore. You have to present a case in chief. Again, another mini trial idea. And that's why it's going to be important for you to get with your counsel to figure out how to present your case. How do you present your evidence? Are we going to do exhibits now, introducing the exhibits, um, getting them reflected on the record? Do we need to have a 209 hearing record now? Um, is, is that going to be subject to disclosure to other owners? Likely not, but all things that you have to think about, which is why you're going to have to adopt a policy and get with your, get with your counsel. And to touch on the, uh, the 209 hearings, you know, before or current statute provides for the 209 hearing, and really it's more of a, a neighborly idea. Hey, before this escalates, you can hold a hearing, the board will listen to you, and hopefully we can resolve this matter before any further action is taken. You look at the provision under Senate Bill 1588, and immediately it's more of an adversarial uh, procedure. You know, you're presenting sides, cases, evidence, et cetera. So really it takes away that, that neighbor, neighborly feel uh, that 209 hearings were supposed to have before where you get together, present, um, you know, your side of things to the to the board. The board listens. Um, so yes, as Clint stated, uh, legal counsel will need to be involved in this because now it is like a mini trial with each side presenting these cases. Section 20, lease information. So under this section, an association may request the following information regarding a lease or rental applicant. Uh, one, the contact info including the name, mailing address, phone number, and email address of each person who will reside at the property in the subdivision under that lease, and two, the commencement date and terms of the lease. All right, this is the ramification I was talking about. If we violate any section of Chapter 209, and again, this applies to single family only, if there's any violation or alleged violation by the board or the association, an owner can bring a justice of the peace action against the POA or board member in JP court and seek damages. Stakes have gotten a little bit higher for chapter 209 now. Now, the weird thing about this is, is that JP courts don't really have injunctive relief authority. So, when you're dealing with a violation of 209, you file a lawsuit in district court to force the association to do something or to stop doing something. JP courts don't really have that authority. So all we're really going to be talking about is did the association violate 209? Okay. And do I get money? Do I get attorney's fees for having to retain an attorney? to bring a lawsuit against the association or board? Are there any damages for me? But this really does um, unfortunately have a bit of a chilling effect on volunteerism. Now again, association board members and the association still has insurance, right? Directors and officers insurance in place, but uh, this really provides for a specific way for owners to to bring a lawsuit against the board or the association when they believe that there's been a violation of chapter 209. All right, let's talk about religious displays once again. So as discussed, this is also in Senate Bill 1588. Uh, this bill went into effect immediately. So if you have standing religious display policies because this bill is effective immediately, those will need to be revised or replaced accordingly. Um, and you should get with your legal counsel as soon as possible to have that done. Uh, this would amend section 202.018 of the Texas Property Code. It would ban property owners associations from enforcing and adopting a restriction that would prohibit owners from displaying one or more religious items. And again, that's on the property or the dwelling. So that takes away the, the entryway requirement. Um, 
unless there's a public safety or it's offensive to a passerby, violates law or attached to a traffic control device, installed on common areas or violates the setbacks, right of ways or the easements. All right, Senate Bill 30, this applies to both single family and condominiums, and it relates to the removal of discriminatory restrictions and provisions from certain real property records. Uh, it, it actually adds section 5.0261 of the Texas Property Code, so chapter five, and it, it basically provides for a process for an owner of property to request removal of a discriminatory provision. So now there's a way to get it done. So discriminatory provisions, the clerk has to look at it. Uh, it's got to be verified. And basically, you know, when you have discriminatory provisions, and this is seen in mostly older communities regarding, you know, race, gender, uh, that kind of thing, there's a way to get that provision removed because it just, it really does not look good when you've got a declaration that has that type of discrimination in it. And there was never a way to get it done with, uh, get it removed without getting a vote of all of your ownership or, you know, 67%. This allows for a way to get it done properly so that, you know, your community isn't viewed as being discriminatory because I'm, I'm sure it's not, but it was still written on the paper. Right. It was still written on that declaration. So this provides a process to to address that. House Bill 3571. And I did see a question earlier in the chat um, regarding vetoing this particular bill. Unfortunately, it was signed by the governor yesterday. So this is going to be law. Now, this would only apply to single families, not condominiums. And this is relating to the regulation of security measures by a property owners association. This is also included with Senate Bill 1588, and now it will become effective September 1st, 2021. So associations should definitely get with their legal counsel to determine um, if they uh, need to adopt a policy to address these changes prior to the effective date of September 1st, 2021. Uh, associations would be prevented from restricting the installation of security measures such as cameras, motions, motion detectors, and perimeter fences. Uh, this is including, but not limited to. So although it, it states cameras, motion detectors, et cetera, that language makes it broader. So there could be other security measures that owners would be permitted to install. However, you can regulate the type of fencing or installation on other property. Um, again, getting into that conversation of the word type. Well, would that include uh, so, you know, the height, the size, et cetera? Of course, it would be on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on your governing documents, um, but very unclear the way that they drafted this particular bill. All right, House Bill 1659, this applies only to single family communities, and it relates to amending a, a declaration to affect certain types of property located in the subdivision. It, it adds a subsection um, D-1, and it basically indicates that the 67% vote requirement does not apply to an amendment that affects a portion of a subdivision that is zoned for or containing a commercial structure, industrial structure, apartment complex, or a condominium. So it's those types of, of kind of mixed use communities or master plan communities that have uh, condominium or, or other commercial associations under the the big umbrella. So it, it kind of clarifies that that 67% requirement doesn't apply in those instances when, when you're trying to change something related to commercial condominium or uh, apartments or industrial. House Bill 1281. This is single family and some condominiums. This was signed by the governor yesterday. So this is going to be law. This is related to the operation of a golf cart without a license plate, a master plan community uh, would take effect September 1st, 2021. Uh, this would allow for golf carts without a license plate to be operated in a master plan community as a residential subdivision under chapter 209 of the Texas property code. So single family and town homes or has a uniform uh, set of deed restrictions. So we, we say some condominiums in there because maybe the condominium is part of a master plan community, 
you know, so again, we've got the master umbrella, you've got the condominium under there. Uh, and as long as you've got uniform deed restrictions, you may be able to utilize this, um, this section of the Texas Transportation Code. All right, Senate Bill 310, it applies to condominiums. And basically what it does is mirror the open records uh, language in Chapter 209 that, that all of y'all that do single family management are very familiar with. It basically allows for a procedure to be followed when an owner wants to request records from the association. It allows the association to do some fee shifting back to the owner for the cost to produce those records uh, and, and basically requires a certified request to specify the types of records you want. Now, this applies to both pre and post 1994 condominiums. So it applies across the board and it is going to require associations, condominium associations to adopt open records policies and records retention policies. So you are now required to adopt those types of policies. If you do not request or if you do not adopt an open records policy and somebody basically requests 5,000 pages of documents, you don't get the fee shift back to the owner. You, you have to bear that cost yourself. And, you know, it's a cost of the association. So it is imperative that you guys, that, that managers and associations get those two policies adopted and recorded. Again, assuming that um, Governor Abbott doesn't take any action on this. Well, actually, no, th this one's already been signed. Uh, is, is that right, Paul? Yep, that was signed uh, June 14th. Yeah, so this one's already signed, signed a couple days ago. Uh, so it, it, it's there. So get with your council to get the open records policy and records retention policies in place. Quickly, we'll discuss House Bill 1927, which would apply to single family and condominiums. Uh, this is a bill that's gotten a big spotlight from the media uh, relating to the provisions governing the carrying of firearm by a person who's 21 years of age or older. Um, basically, it's going to take, take effect on September 1st, 2021 and would allow anyone over the age of 21 who can legally carry a firearm to carry the firearm without a handgun license. However, private businesses such as management companies can still post those restriction signs under 30.06 and 30.07 of the Texas Penal Code on the possession of firearms. So those signs that you see outside of, of businesses, those can still be posted in order to uh, avoid any firearms. Senate Bill 6. So this applies across the board for single family and condominiums. And it actually provides for a process for the association to avoid liability for causing exposure to the pandemic. Now, uh, you know, we're running tight on time. So I'm, I'm just going to go through each one of these slides quickly. It, it takes effect September 1st, and it, it amends the Civil Practice and Remedies Code but there is a very complicated process the association has to, has to implement in order to receive protection under this chapter, uh, chapter 148. So again, if you want to utilize this, you need to get with your council to adopt a policy. We can go into subsection A real quick. So again, Person and Corporation, Section 311.005, you're not liable unless the claimant can show the POA knowingly failed to warn the individual or remediated condition and had control over the condition, knew the person was likely to be in con likely to come into contact with the condition and did not notify the person or remediate, or subsection B. Next slide. Uh, unless the person knowingly failed to implement or comply with government CDC standards or other local standards that the person had a reasonable opportunity and ability to implement those protocols. So if you've got protocols within Travis County or whatever county you're in here in the state of Texas, you need to implement them. You're also going to have to adopt a policy that complies with this section. So if, you've, if you're complying with this section, and you're implementing proper policy, and you're enforcing such implementation, right? Not just merely posting a sign up, you've actually got to do some sort of enforcement measure, then you get protected uh, un un under this chapter. So 
it's a way to add that extra level of protection because we all probably know this now, if an association gets sued for um, somebody contracting the COVID-19, that's pretty much what we're dealing with. There is no insurance coverage. Now, while it may be difficult to prove up, it's going to be still a cost of the association to retain an attorney to defend. Move on to the next slide. Let's get into our questions. All right, Paul, I'll let you handle our pre-submitted, sir, and, and I can chime in, but I'll, I'll turn it over to you. We, we got a bunch of questions submitted to us prior to the presentation that we're going to address first, and then we're going to move into the Q&A, the 77 questions that have been uh, submitted thus far. Paul? Thanks, Clint. And so we'll get into the pre-submitted questions quickly. Uh, one of them, how does the security measures add mesh? How does the security measures bill mesh with the city municipality ordinances to limit light? Um, more specifically, with the association being unable to deny security measures like floodlights, can they still deny certain lights based on other city ordinances prohibiting that light? Well, whenever it comes to city ordinances, that's going to be up to the city to enforce. Uh, the POA is not going to enforce those uh, particular ordinances. ordinances. Um, so whenever it comes to anything like the floodlight, et cetera, um, again, that's going to be on the city to enforce their ordinance. And the cities are so good on enforcement, right, Paul? Yeah, they're real fast, too. Um, next, any effect on board of directors being on committees? So with the bills that we discussed, the only effect would be on the ACC, which would be the Architectural Control Committee. Under your documents, it might be Architectural Review Committee. Um, on other committees, uh, there's no effect. Can older associations hold online annual meetings if the documents don't allow for online voting? Uh, yes for single family, arguably no for condos whenever it comes to the voting requirement. Can the management company act as the architectural control committee? I believe that some management companies offer that service, but it will uh, likely be a, an additional fee onto the contract. See. So for the security measures bill, uh, the bill indicates the HOA can restrict the type of materials used, but what about the height? Um, well, looking at the, the term type, and we've been back and forth on this, Clint and I, arguably the, the term type is pretty broad. So yeah, that, that would include height, but again, it really depends on what your governing documents say, if they provide for that specific height. Let's see. So since Abbott has not yet signed bills, can he still make changes to them or is it an all or nothing situation? Um, well, he can either veto, he can either sign or let it slide. Um, he, he's not going to go in there and amend it himself. So which of the legislative changes will have the most profound effect on our, on our HOA? It's going to be Senate Bill 1588 because that's the one that includes the most provisions. Uh, like I said, there's 27 sections of that bill, um, so that will have the largest impact on property owners associations throughout Texas. Perfect. All right, let's move over to the Q&As that came in. Now we're up to 82. Not sure we'll be able to get to all of them, but uh, is there any hope to get SB 1588 vetoed? Again, as Paul mentioned, it is in front of the governor. Yes, you can oppose it. You can send the governor a letter. Uh, you can look through the TCAA website to get that letter and submit to the governor that you are opposed. Next question, uh, Virgin Mary, Paul, six feet, can you do it in the front yard? As we discussed, arguably that language is broad enough to permit that uh, six foot Virgin Mary statue. Yep. So if you are Christian and, um, you know, you, you true Christian, then yes, absolutely. Uh Will there be legal challenges by CAI if these become law? No, the law is the law, right? We can be unhappy with the law, but we're going to have to fight uh, the legislators in 2023. So we've got two years to deal with this. Does this apply to co-ops? It's going to depend on the uh, section that it's amending, but no, for the most part, this will not apply to co-ops. That's correct. We don't have too many cooperatives here in the state of Texas, no. uh, but good, good question. If the restrictions say you can collect and how you can collect, do you still need a separate collection policy? 
It's not required, but I always recommend a collection policy. It's transparent for the owners and also it gives the board of directors the procedures that they will follow to collect the assessments. Now, if your declaration clearly provides for collection of assessments, uh, the assessment obligation, et cetera, uh, you don't need the policy, but again, it is definitely recommended. Does a collection policy need to be recorded? Uh, I'll answer this one. Yes, 202.006 requires a document you want to enforce um, to be recorded in order to be enforceable. Uh, let's see what else here. Hmm. Section two of 1588. Paul, do you remember that one? Which section was that? Uh, let me take a look. It really depends on if it's 209 or 202. If it's 209 or 202, then it's going to apply to uh, townhomes. Perfect. All right. Let's get back into it. Um, with ARC guidelines in place, can the association still restrict size? I'm assuming we're talking about fencing. Arguably, yes, is what Paul said. Uh, it's broad enough, but again, get with your counsel because he or she's going to have to give you some advice and thoughts on adopting some sort of a policy. In our community, we don't we don't allow privacy fences around pools. Would this, would this be allowed? Absolutely, state law is going to trump. What do you? <laughs> so. Um, there's a question about kind of swimming pool enclosures. It's, it's not whether or not we like them or do not like them. It's just that state of Texas does not traditionally allow for complete enclosures for swimming pools. Uh, but the law came in. We, we were a state that liked or encouraged communities to decide what they want to allow or disallow. Swimming pools are already required to be uh, fenced in for security and safety purposes by state law. So Fencing was already required for pools, but this amendment now requires kind of more broader enclosure options. Ooh, what, Paul, you, you tell me what you think about this one. Um, for security measures, does this include guard dogs? <laughs> We've had a lot of questions uh, concerning what security measures, what that encompasses. And unfortunately, like I said before, it has that including but not limited to. But I think at the end of the day, you have to look at the reasonableness of, of the security measure and what it's really being used for. Would it include guard dogs? Um, you can make the argument that it could, you can make the argument that it can't. Um, but yes, we've had many questions regarding these different uh, different types of security measures, You know, shotgun traps and things like that, that of course would not be allowed. Um, but I would think guard dogs in the, in the front um, you know, might, might cause a nuisance, might be a violation of some other provision uh, under the governing documents as well. Perfect. Does this, do these laws apply to HOAs as well as planned communities? So when we said single family, we, we meant any community that is bound by chapter 209 of the Texas property code. That typically includes master plan communities. That includes HOAs, homeowners associations, and it includes certain townhomes that are bound by chapter 209 of the Texas property code. When we say condominium, that means those condominiums, and some of them may look like a single family community, but the declaration will say somewhere it's bound by chapter 82 or it's a condominium. So when, when we say single family, that's what we mean. When we say condo, that's what we mean. Do we have access to the slides after the meeting? Yes, the slides will be provided to you after the meeting. Um, gas companies, do they restrict the location of fencing in the front? restricting meter access? The answer is yes, there are a lot of easement rights for front yard areas. Uh, so again, that may be another authority you can kind of lean on a little bit to prevent any kind of obtrusive fencing in the front yard. Uh, resales. Paul, what if the resale is ordered by a title company? Do, do, the, do the rules still apply? Yes, I think the caps would still apply. Uh, does the language state business days for the resale certificate? Uh, business days. Do these all apply to developing communities? So we, we mentioned caveats or carve outs for declarant controlled communities. So if you're a developing community subject to declarant control, then the ones we carved out do not apply to them. 
Now, if they apply across the board, then yes, they apply across the board. So a lot of these sections apply to developer controlled or developing communities as well. Uh, oh, uh, 375.75, does that include expedited delivery fees? What do you think, Paul? If it's tacked on to the resale certificate, then arguably yes. And the reason I say that is we're taking a conservative approach here. This is going to be brand new law, and I believe at some point it will be litigated. Uh, we do not want our clients to be the party to that litigation. Unfortunately, the language under that particular statute is very, very broad. So again, you know, Paul and I are just talking about it from an educational perspective. Some of these are going to be very document intensive looks. So you're going to have to get with your counsel to figure out whether or not there is a way to charge other charges um, that, that are not truly resale certificate fees. And again, does it really prevent a rush fee? Very broad language we're dealing with here. So again, the community needs to get with their counsel and get formal legal advice. Paul and I are merely providing educational tips and ideas right now. But it, you know, the way it's worded, I, I think we've got some concerns. Absolutely. Uh, would the cap apply to packages that include the resale certificate fee, statements of accounts, transfer fees, or is it only limited to resale certificates? Well, I think, again, we're getting into uh, really the weeds here that's going to be on a case-by-case -case basis, because at what point can you discern between the, the resale certificate and the administrative costs, right? So I think that whenever it comes to these particular issues, you need to contact your legal counsel to really determine what fees can be separated from the resale certificate and then what fees have to be included or capped um, at the amounts provided under the statute. Very good question. Um, how does townhome communities re uh, relate to the regulations? So unfortunately, the word townhome uh, can mean a condominium or a single family. So it's really document driven. You've got to look at your governing documents and it'll, it, it'll help tell you whether or not it is a condominium or a single family. It will be one or the other. Uh, does CAI have a lobbyist available to them? Yes. Uh, well, not CAI. TCAA has a lobbyist available to them, and they've utilized them through the whole process. As I mentioned, Paul is a TCAA board member, and they worked really hard to put a lot of these to bed. But unfortunately, there was some sneaky uh, attachments that occurred on the House floor during the voting. All of these sections of SB 1588, or a lot of them were tacked on at the last minute. Do we have to retroactively update every management certificate we have filed and also file all of those with TREC? So let's talk about that here. Um, let me pull up, pull up the relevant section. Give me one second. Paul, you can go over to the next question while I look this up for, for this question, because it's a good one. All right, let's take a look. Getting lost in the uh, questions here. Let's see, townhouse community, lobbyist. What if you have a community that is five homes? So whenever we're talking about the applicability, and I think this question is likely referring to uh, the ACC members, well, that only applies to an association that's 40 lots and up. So if you have five homes, that particular provision would not. As for all the other ones under Senate Bill 1588 that would be applicable to 209 and 202, if you're still a subdivision or single family, they're still going to apply to you. Perfect. Thanks, Paul. Um, again, if you are a condominium regime that looks like a single family community when you drive in, you are subject to condominium law, not single family law. So condominium law only. Um, and then back to the management certificate question, I'll read what the end of the bill says. A community association or property owners association that has on or before December 1st of 21 recorded a management certificate or amended management certificate with a county clerk under 209004 shall electronically file the most recently recorded management certificate 
with Trek not later than June 1st, 2022. So that gives you a little bit of wiggle room if you've already got your management certificate in place. Uh, let's see here. Ooh, okay. So Paul, the, um, the $50,000 contract requirement, does it apply to long-term bulk service agreements that are called out in the declaration? So let's do, let's do trash service that lasts 15 years. So this is one that we've been batting back and forth. Uh, cause if you look at the actual language, say it's a $50,000 amount, it doesn't say whether that's going to accrue over time whether the 50,000 needs to be provided in black letters under the contract, et cetera. So there is an argument that, uh, you know, you have uh, bulk waste, things like that, um, that would certainly add up to $50,000 over time and would be included on this provision. Um, of course, there's arguments the other way that if the amount is not actually stated in the contract of the $50,000, well, would this provision actually apply? And is it intended to apply to uh, the waste contracts and landscaping contracts, et cetera. Paul, I, I, if we have a board member who is also on the ACC or ARC, when do they have to get off one or the other? So I believe that provision is effective September 1st if this is passed. So leading up to it, um, I would say get your ducks in a row and even before this thing becomes effective, uh, try to get off of there just to make sure that your association's in compliance with this thing because you don't want this thing to go into effect. And then a few days later, uh, you're still in violation with a board member being part of the ACC and then also the board. And it, you know, it's, it's worded a person may not be appointed or elected to serve on an ACC, but, you know, Arguably, oh, well, I've already, I was appointed prior to the law becoming effective. It's just not worth going down that road. You need to create some separation to Paul's point. Uh, ACC requirement does not apply to developer or declarant control. Uh, so those associations under, under declarant control, ACC does not apply. Again, we talked about the exceptions for developer for each one of the bills. If we didn't talk about it, then it does apply. Will the standard chapter 209 letter need to be changed as well? Yes, as Paul mentioned, there's an increase in the days for response. Um, also, if you are using credit bureau reporting, there's more letters you've got to comply with as well. So yes, 209 requirements are changing. Same thing for deed restriction enforcement, 209 letters will likely need to be modified. Oh, distinctions between an ACC, an Architectural Control Committee, and a Modifications Committee. Again, it, it defines ARC um, in, in the code. So it's really, that's document driven, but good question, because sometimes you've got new construction committees, modification committees, architectural committees, all things that need to be looked at with your council. And, and, and again, it's document driven. Uh, and look, we are uh, well past our time. Unfortunately, we, we, Paul and I did our best. We weren't able to get to all of the questions. But again, uh, this PowerPoint will be available. The video will be available as well. And if you've got more questions or need some help or, or you know, basically advice on what you need to do, please reach out to your counsel. He or she is going to be able to assist. Paul and I, from an educational standpoint, we try to follow the five minute freebie rule. So if, if you've got something that you really need to discuss and need some assistance on, you're always welcome to give Paul and I, uh, Paul or I a call. We're, we're always happy to, to listen and provide help where we can. Again, we can't really provide legal advice because you may not be our client, but we, we can at least listen and point you in the right direction. With that, just a big thank you for joining us today. I hope y'all got something out of the presentation today. And, um, and again, we, we look forward to seeing y'all next month for uh, another, another wonderful webinar, or, or it may be actually next week, excuse me, we've got another great webinar coming up yep. uh, Wednesday the 23rd. Paul, would you like to say anything in closing, sir? 
Uh, just to reiterate what you said, you know, if there's any issues uh, that our current clients have, uh, please reach out. And then, of course, if anybody else has any questions, we're happy to assist as well. Um, in regards to uh, TCAA, if anybody's interested in sending a letter to the governor, I'm happy to assist with that process. Um, those letters can be sent to me. I can send them to our lobbyist and we can get them to the governor as soon as possible because Senate Bill 1588 still has not been signed. Um, but other than that, thank you everyone for attending. And uh, yes, be sure to attend next week to see uh, Mr. Ortego and Mr. Holtz present on successful board meetings and member meetings. All right, bye everybody.